think is the most important part about content is that content is what's what is the past long that happens in discourse right and the discourse that we talk about right so i'll see an ad i'll make a meme about the ad and that's going to get spread not the ad right that is we communicate through these cultural texts through content be it memes videos images and the alike that we propagate from person to person to help us get a sense of what is acceptable within our communities within our networks within our our people right we look we negotiate and construct what what is cool what's not cool what's in what's out based upon these atomized objects content and for marketers to to just now realize that hey we should probably double down on this is kind of like well what have you been doing all this time and that's a wrap the weekly wrap ending July 31st, 2020. This week I'm pondering why we need content marketing. And by the way, marketing, it's gonna start raining on content marketing and 10 ways you can create more engaging content for your audiences. So let's wrap it up, shall we? Our theme this week, wants versus needs. In the immortal words of the Rolling Stone, you can't always get what you want, but if you try sometimes, you find you get what you need. That's what I want. And this, this is the Weekly Wrap. Hello, everybody. Welcome to episode number 80 of the Weekly Wrap, our weekly play on words at play in the world this week. This week, I've got a question. Why do we need content marketing? And we've got just a wonderful conversation with the great Marcus Collins, someone who is truly and absolutely diving deep into the pool of marketing thought leadership. As always, I'm your host, Robert Rose, Chief Strategy Advisor with the Content Marketing Institute, and it's time to get this week's show underway. product sexy now don't worry we're not going down any weird not safe for work routes here what I mean to ask is do people buy your product because they want it or because they need it and would you approach marketing any differently based on the answer to that question perhaps you sell products that everybody wants but no one really needs like art cosmetics gym memberships alcohol restaurants social media apps now please don't at me and tell me all about how tequila is an exception to that rule. I mean, I, I see you here. I see you. Now, these products and services are typically what we call discretionary purchases. Or perhaps you sell a service or utility of selling something that people need, but no one actually really wants to purchase, like healthcare, electricity, fuel, insurance. These are typically what we call non-discretionary purchases. So should we market these two categories differently? Now, a discussion over what is really a need versus a want will naturally lead us to philosophy and probably a good bottle of Bordeaux and also a drawing of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Now, we would all most likely agree on most of the layers of needs, physiological, safety, love, esteem, but it's as we get to that top layer, the self-actualization layer, that which fuels one's potential, we would probably have cause to open another bottle of Bordeaux. But I believe we would ultimately conclude that self-actualization is a need. So, from a marketing perspective, we sometimes believe that we design our products and services to fulfill needs, but differentiate those products by fulfilling wants. For example, our customers need basic insurance, but they buy our insurance based on the offer of more customized plans that meet their personal lifestyle. But aren't those wants 
just components of higher levels of need? Are they not there to just help people fulfill a better version of themselves? Now, this doesn't mean that consumers are always right either. I mean, they may not actually ultimately feel more self-actualized by purchasing the loaded potato skins other than the vegetable plate. But that doesn't in and of itself make it any lesser of a need. It's the act of consuming, not the product itself, that satisfies the emotion. So in other words, asking if we should market differently to people who need or want our product service is the wrong question. Why do people buy things they don't need? Well, simply because they do need them. Maslow himself referred to this idea when discussing self-actualization, the highest level of need. He said, what a person can be, they must be. Thus, any product or service we make fulfills both needs and wants. Why? Well, because they're all needs. Now, well now here's something you need. It's time to recognize there's something we can do to put the experience back into customer experience. You know, businesses all over the world have recognized that great digital experiences, they're not a nice to have anymore, they are a must have. But how, how do you evolve into that? Well, as the well-known saying goes, content is king, but how do customers create that king, create and publish effective, engaging content that can take their customer experiences to a whole other level? Well, our sponsor, Sitecore, recently held its inaugural Marketer Virtual Day, and one of the tracks there was dedicated to helping organizations better manage their content from end to end. They've got this free post-event guide. It's called Understanding the End-to-End -end Content Lifecycle. It's got practical, usable, actionable steps that you can take to optimize your content engine, personalize your digital experiences, and take your customer experience to a whole other level. I want you to go download this guide today. You can see it right here. It's at cmi.media slash sitecore dash lifecycle. That URL again, cmi.media slash sitecore dash lifecycle. I want to thank the good folks at Sitecore for being our wonderful summer sponsor here on the Weekly Wrap. So now, well, now it's time for our interview segment. And boy, do we have a good one for you this week. This guy is just absolutely awesome. The wonderful Marcus Collins. Uh, I am such a fan of the work that he does. First and foremost, because he's a teacher, Marcus studies the effects of cultural contagion on consumer behavior as a marketing professor at the Ross School of Business uh, at the University of Michigan. And he translates these cultural learnings into blue chip brands uh, that wish to create contagious marketing. Um, he extends both across the world world of online, of offline, social. Um, he's done that throughout his career, and he's been acknowledged for his strategic and creative contributions. He is uh, on Advertising Age's 40 Under 40 recipient award winner. He's launched campaigns like Cliff Paul for State Farm Insurance, uh, the Made in America Music Festival for Budweiser, Hello Brooklyn for the Brooklyn Nets, uh, Ego and Netflix's Stranger Things Conquest. Prior to his tenure in all of this in advertising, he worked as a music and tech startup co-founder, Muse Recordings, and then leading iTunes and Nike Sports music initiatives uh, at Apple. Uh, before, he, before that, he actually ran a digital agency and the digital strategy for the music um, icon Beyonce. And while we didn't actually get to talk a lot about Beyonce in our chat, we did talk a lot about culture and content and a little bit of history as well. I think you're really going to dig this interview with my good friend, Marcus Collins. Hey, Marcus, what's going on? Cool, man. How are you? Doing pretty well yourself? I'm doing very, very well. Thank you very much. I am digging, by the way, the Campbell's Soup Can. Now, you got to tell me the story behind this. The, the behind you right now what what is that all about yeah so this is the the warhol imprint from andy warhol um and you know it's it's sort of ironic right so i work in advertising and warhol's sort of critique on consumption uh was looking at mass consumption like you know the the campbell soup and how do you make mass consumption art um, and here it is, art on the wall of an advertiser who is making things, oftentimes, a commodity. So if nothing else, it's a reminder to not take yourself so seriously. <laughs> yeah, oh, <boy. laughs> exactly. That's exactly, you know, funny, it was one of, one of my marketing bosses uh, when I was just starting out, used to say exactly that. He was like, he was like, you know, 
we're not, he was a ex green beret and, um, and he was my boss in marketing and he would say, you know, look, we're not, you know, let's, let's just be, be, be very mindful here. We're not curing cancer here. Right. We're, right. you know, it's just marketing, you know? Yeah. Um, so you and I, and you're a, a friend and family of CMI and have been forever and, and we'll be speaking at content marketing world and, and, and all of that. But for those in the audience who don't know you, tell us your story. Where, where did you come from and, and where are you and what are you working on now? So uh, born and raised uh, Detroit native. I am an advertiser uh, by coincidence. You know, I started <laughs> off as an engineer, materials engineer, because I thought the engineering was cool. Though it is, I thought materials engineering was like really cool. It's not how I describe it today. But so I engineer, ended up going to the music industry, did a startup that did well until it didn't because the music industry sucks. So I went back to school to get my MBA sort of figured out, um, spent some time at Apple, moved to New York, ran digital strategy for Beyonce before going into the world of, of advertising. I really cut my teeth at an agency called Translation. Um, based in New York, it's about helping contemporary brands thrive or helping ambitious brands thrive in contemporary culture. And from there, sort of widened my aperture about the, the role that brands play in our everyday lives, particularly how we construct meaning and the identity projects that we pursue. So since then, um, I found myself in the world of academia. I'm now a professor at the Ross School of Business, University of Michigan, uh, while also practicing as an advertiser. So I have one foot in the world of academia and one foot in scholarship trying to close the academic practitioner gap. That's the, ah, uh, you just described my dream job right there. I mean, I would, I, that, that's, that's fantastic. I, I would love to be able to, 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 to do that. That's, that's so wonderful. Well, I want to come back and talk a little bit about um, all of that idea uh, of culture and maybe press a little bit on that whole Beyonce thing. Um, Let's do it. <laughs> but um, one of the things that we want to do, obviously, this uh, on the show is to, is to talk a little bit about what's going on in the news. And I would love to get your quick hot take on something that came out um, just, uh, I, I guess, a week or so ago. Um, the ANA actually put out a new research report. And the research report, I guess, has been done at the end of 2019, but they just released the, the report, I guess, just now. And it says, and, and this is wonderful that the ANA is actually even saying the words, but um, the headline that, uh, that we'll link to, of course, in the show notes is that spending on content marketing is climbing sharply, uh, so says the ANA. And it opens up by saying, advertisers are embracing content marketing more than ever, despite having misgivings about the lack of accurate and insightful measurement of its effectiveness. Um, this is what the new study is, says uh, from the ANA in partnership with the Content Council. The study called Growth and Opportunities in Content Marketing was conducted at the end of 2019 and revealed that over a two-year period, spending on content marketing showed a 73% average budget increase and also projected a 42% spending hike two years into the future. Now, this is all pre-COVID and whatnot, but uh, certainly um, projecting out beyond that. Um, respondents show that their commitment in content marketing has grown substantially in the past two years, 52% indicating a strong commitment, double the figure from two years prior, and content marketing also commands a substantial portion, 18% of overall marketing budgets, according to respondents' current estimates of total spending. And it goes on to, to go through a few quotes from uh, what people think about the point of view, but I'm most interested in your point of view. What do you, so, what do you make of all of this? I mean, are you seeing this, you know, so we're, from where you sit with one foot in academia and one foot in the advertising world, are you seeing some of the B2C and cultural brands out there trying to get into this whole content marketing thing? I mean, I read that headline or hear the headline, I think, you know, welcome to the modern world. Like, <clears throat> of course, I mean, yes, yeah. thank you. Like, you know, and water is wet. You know, <laughs> I, think, I think about it this way, you know, we, there's so much scrutiny that's put on content, um, digital marketing, social media marketing when it comes to measurement. But how accurately do we actually measure television? Right? We use television because as a vehicle to communicate brands and branded products because it is status quo, it's wide reaching, it has all of these benefits. But measurement, it's not very, very, very great at. Um, when it comes to content, while nothing is 100% for measurement perspective, A, 
the atomized versions of these longer forms of things, we can at least have a better tracing of where it starts and who it touches, though attribution is still questionable. We still get a sense of how it spreads, right? How it passes from person to person, which I think is the most important part about content is that content is what's, what is the pass along that happens in discourse, right? And the discourse that we talk about, right? So I'll see an ad, I'll make a meme about the ad and that's going to get spread, not the ad, right? That is, we communicate through these cultural texts, through content, be it memes, videos, images, and the alike that we propagate from person to person to help us get a sense of what is acceptable within our communities, within our networks, within our, our people, right? We look, we negotiate and construct what, what is cool, what's not cool, what's in, what's out, based upon these atomized objects, content. And for marketers to, to just now realize that, hey, we should probably double down on this, is kind of like, well, what have you been doing all this time? You know, it's like, if you observe the way people exchange ideas and the way people actually decide whether your brand is cool or not, it's through the discourse that happens and the content that people exchange. This is the currency of culture. This is the currency of the network. It's how we decide what is acceptable for people like me. Um, so I, I, I commend them for sort of joining us. <laughs> and and finding them out that. that water is wet. <laughs> exactly. And, you know, and I hope that more marketers see this. At the very least, I hope that it's a signal for more marketers to, uh, to realize that, you know, this is acceptable and this is probably where they should be spending their time. Now, the thing is that this isn't a zero-sum game. This isn't like do content marketing and get rid of all the other stuff. It is, as Jerome McCarthy told us in the 1960s, it's a marketing mix. <laughs> yeah. It is a mix. Yeah. Right? And all the pieces together is what makes cake taste so good. Yeah. Right? If you get into a bar of, of, of butter, it would be disgusting. Or you just threw flour in your mouth or grabbed sugar and ate it. It would all be disgusting. But together is what makes it awesome, makes it delicious. And that's sort of how marketing to think about it. Like, how do I add these pieces that are within the cultural zeitgeist so that people move? And that's the job of marketing, get people to adopt behavior. It's such a cool point of view. I mean, you know, it's, 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 it's interesting because what you're talking about has indeed been around for forever. I mean, I remember talking with Jonathan Mildenhall, who, you know, of course, yeah. ex, you know, CMO of Airbnb. And then when I was talking with him back in 2013, um, he was the, you know, creative, uh, uh, head of creative for Coca-Cola and he called it liquid content. He was talking yeah. about exactly liquid what you're talking about, right? Which is content that wants to be shared, that wants right. to be, you know, sort of flow through the cultural zeitgeist. And he looked at that as sort of as he put it, filling the emotional well, right? Filling the emotional well of, of, of audiences. And that was his job, right? You know, because as he said, you know, with, with Coca-Cola, I don't get to change the bottle. I can't change what's inside the bottle. I certainly can't touch the mark or what, you know, the mark stands for. He said, yeah. the only thing I can do is use those assets in a way that is really, you know, wants to be shared by, by people. Yeah, I mean, the Absolutely. You know, and to your point, I mean, it can't be said enough that content marketing is not new at all. In fact, I think the oldest content marketing that comes to mind for me is probably, are you familiar with the furrow by John Deere? Of course. Yeah. I mean, yeah. that's the poster so child, right? Yeah. They've been making since the 1800s. Like we're yeah. talking about over, like this isn't a new thing at all. Betty Crocker, she's been making recipes sure. as branded content, right? You know, Michelin star, the Michelin magazine, like these are all branded content things. None of this is new, but the things that stick in the, in the cultural zeitgeist are the things that win. Yeah. Well, and that's a great segue because uh, going back to what you were talking about at the top of the show, where this idea of culture, I know this is something that you're, that you're passionate about and, and are actively researching. And I would love to get your thoughts on you know, I know one of the things that you're working on is sort of looking at both perspectives, right? Both from the consumer side, looking at how they're becoming part of 
cultures, right? Whether it's sneakerheads or, you know, different kinds of subcultures that attach themselves to brands. And then from the brand perspective, also looking at how brands are trying to attach themselves sometimes in not so successful ways to right. more topical cultural, you know, for everything from racial injustice to, you know, COVID to everything that's going on in the world. What are some of the things that you're discovering as you do this research, what are some of the things that you're discovering that actually are making things work? You know, so I think about culture, it's about sort of framing like what is culture? And we, every, of course, it's a word we all use, but seldom like really understand. I mean, culture essentially is, it is the symbols, the values, and the norms that govern a group of people, right? It is what is normal. And we all subscribe to, to different cultures, right? And the things that we consume, where we go, what we buy, they are informed by what is culturally normal, right? One, one says it this way, that consumption by its very nature is a cultural act. Mm. So for marketers to be able to tap into culture, it's unbelievably powerful, right? Uh, you know, when people like me do something like this, I do it as well which is whether I like it or not, like this is what we do, so I'm doing it, right? Um, so with this in mind, culture becomes a really powerful vehicle for marketers to get people to move. <clears throat> and what these cultures of consumption, these are people who not only buy, they're not, they define themselves as a sneaker head, but they, they buy certain brands, certain products, but there are cultural characteristics that are embedded into what it means to have that identity marker, right? And it means to be a sneaker head. So for brands to participate in these cultures of consumption requires understanding the nuances of the culture. Now that's like brands trying to be a part of what already exists. But then when there's like these cultural happenings that go on, when brands don't understand the nuances, the beliefs, the, the meaning making process that goes into these things, they find themselves jumping into the water and belly flopping. <laughs> yeah. Or at, at worst, maybe even just being like seen apathetically. Right. You know, they say things like, you know, we stand for, you know, we, we are completely against racial, uh, you know, racial discrimination. And, you know, we stand for, you know, for, for justice. And it's like, you know, we hope you would. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's anything novel. It's like, we aren't racist here. Oh, okay. yeah. okay. Like, Great. <laughs> is that meant to be celebrated? Like that's yeah. that is that's the hypothesis yeah. we go into yeah. thinking that. Um, but when brands don't have like a very clear point of view and an ideology, you know, they find themselves just sort of jumping on what already exists. Yeah. And this is an important part to note. I think this should be, if nothing else, the empowering part and the sobering part for marketers that you know. Marketers don't control brands. Like we don't, we don't, um, we don't own the brand. We are stewards of the brand, right? And that is, we give it marks, we give it identifiers, we give it expression, we give it a point of view, and we put things in the world, be it product, messaging, in a combination of the two, in hopes that the population would see the world similarly, right? Because what happens is that a brand puts some messaging in the world, be it an ad, be it content, and the culture, the collective says, okay, thank you, we'll take that and negotiate what we feel about it. Negotiate what it means, negotiate if it's cool, if it's in or if it's out, and then we'll tell you. Then the brand sort of goes through this volley between themselves, the brand, and the people, and the marketers are the, the stewards of the brand in that way. But if we don't understand the meaning making process of the culture of the collective, then we'll always be out of sync, no matter how good our intentions are. Right. Which I yeah, think it's is the, 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 it's the funny. It's, it's, it's a little bit like that, um, that meme that goes around the Steve Buscemi meme, right? Where he's wearing <laughs> the music band t-shirt and he's like, hello, hello my, my fellow millennials. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right. Uh, I'm here to participate in your yes. culture, right? <laughs> yes, exactly. I mean, that is, and this is what brands end up doing. It's like, you know, you have no reason to be here. You're not contributing anything. And, and that's the thing that the brands who lead culture are more successful than those that follow 
because they push culture forward. They contribute to the culture. And the only way they can contribute is by understanding the meaning making process of the people. And that's kind of the biggest, I think the biggest rub, that's the biggest issue here, which gets at, you know, the, the headline you read is that marketers don't know jack about people. Yeah. We suck at understanding people, which is why we can, you know, a decade later, one would argue, they say, content is a theme. Maybe yeah, we yeah. should do that. Like, <laughs> yeah. Just pay attention. You know, it, 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 it's our, um, our anemia at really understanding people. It's where, where we get ourselves in trouble. And there's a great quote from W.E.B. W. Du Bois that I love. He says, you know, this is the tragedy of the age. Not that men um, are poor because men, everyone knows something about poverty. Not that men are, are, are dishonest because what is truth, but that men know so little of men. And it's just yeah. true. We just don't understand us very well. And despite good intention, you know, without the perception of understanding the way people see the world, we find ourselves out of step with culture. And as a result, the marketing fails to do what it's supposed to do. It's such a great point. I mean, you know, it is, it is, it is not uncommon for any of us to talk to a brand and, and the first thing, you know, what we, what we end up, you know, asking as, you know, the first question is, Truly, if you peel it all back, it's, it's what do we understand about our customer? And, mm -hmm. but what the answer usually is, is what do we want to say, right? In other words, if I go in and I say to a brand, hey, what's, tell me about your marketing strategy. And the immediate answer is something to the effect of, well, we need our customers to understand that we're innovative. And it's like, no, they don't. They really don't. They don't need to understand. They will get about their day just fine not understanding that you're innovative. You need to understand what they want to hear, not necessarily what you want to say. And yeah. it's such a great point that, you know, most of us don't. We don't actually ever bother to ask. That's right. I mean, you know, I, I, I tell my clients that, you know, no one shares toothpaste stories. <laughs> right. Exactly. Tell people stories. Right. They're like, but we have 15% more fluoride in the toothpaste. Right. Great. No one cares. But you. Yeah. You know, like, those things don't matter to me at all. And it's, and it's the thing is that it's almost laughable how, how bad we are at understanding people that we actually put them in these boxes that are artificiated, right? Like, hello, my fellow millennials. Well, makes a millennial millennial, their age group. So yeah. I mean, they're all the same because they were born at the same time. That's, that's just ridiculous. Yeah. Like, it's the idea of demography as a descriptor to actually define people it's just a blunt instrument. It's just not real. Like, you know, I'm 41 years old, African-American, if you have noticed, born and raised in Detroit, went to public schools my entire life. If a marketer saw that on a brief, they say, oh, he must walk like this, talk like this, sure. hang out with these people and do those things. This is what they do. And while I am those statistical uh, uh, identifiers, they don't describe who I am. And the only way you can know who I am is to get to know me. That's and great. fortunately, we don't, we, we, we don't, we don't do it. We, we, we have all the data in the world, so much data about people, but yet we don't know them because we mistake information for intimacy. And which means that if we want to really, if we want our stuff to work, we got to get close. It's amazing. I mean, I love that line. I love that line, sort of misplacing information for intimacy. What a, what a, what a, great, uh, what a great thing. Well, my friend, this could go on all day. Um, and, um, but the and day has I would, to move. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I would love it too. But um, for the sake of time, uh, I would love to know where people can connect with you. Where can they follow you? Where can they see the work you're, you're doing? Um, and uh, tell us where we can find you online. Awesome. You can uh, check me out on my website, marktothec.com, M-A-R-C-T-O-T-H-E-C, Mark to the C. Um, all my handles are that too, at Mark to the C on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn. I uh, would love to, to hear from you. So awesome. Thank you so very much, my friend, for being on the show today. I really appreciate it. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Well, 
Well, that brings us to our last segment, which is one post on CMI site that I'd love for you to take a first look at, a third look at, a fourth look at. And this one, folks, this one's an oldie. Uh, it is an oldie but a goodie. I dug it out of the archives, and it was just perfect for this week's theme. Uh, it's actually 10 years old, making it certainly one of the oldest articles we've ever featured here on the Weekly Wrap. Uh, it's 10 Ways to Make Your Content More Engaging, written by the wonderful and lovely Michelle Lynn. Um, and with the help of CMI contributors, Michelle basically tackles a whole sort of roundup post of how to create content that's more engaging. Uh, and it was the biggest challenge, quite frankly, when we did the research 10 years ago and remains one of the biggest challenges that we see year after year. Um, and so we asked the question, what does engaging content mean to you, to all of these wonderful thought leaders out there? And they've just really, really answered uh, in great, great numbers and, and great value there. One of my favorites here, by the way, is from Patsy Krakow, who uh, talks about how you've got to get to an emotional pathway. Uh, and she describes negative focusing on pain, positive, imagining a better future, rational, logistical, logical analysis of facts, curiosity, desire, objections, scarcity, just a really interesting way to look at uh, creating engaging content and a structure for that. Um, and there are a whole bunch of others. So I want you to go check out this post. It's a goodie um, and an oldie, and it's just worth about three to five minutes of your time. And well, well, that's a wrap of episode number 80. I hope you're all out there truly taking care of one another these days. We could all use a little self-care and a little care of each other. Wear a mask. Just do it. Just do it for me. Do it for CMI. Do it for yourself. Do it for your colleagues. And just wear a mask. Do it. I'm so grateful. I'm so grateful for all of you out there taking 35 minutes out of your day to either watch or listen to this show. Uh, and I really hope you're digging it. Uh, we're having a ton of fun making it these days. But let us know, won't you? Hashtag us up on Weekly Wrap on the social media channels. Uh, anything that you'd like to see from guests to news to the types of content we're doing. Uh, and if you hate it, like you're going to leave a nasty review or whatever, don't do that. Don't leave a bad review. But just, you know, if you didn't like it, you know, well, in the immortal words of Hank Williams, another love before my time made your heart sad and blue. And so my heart, well, it's paying now for the things I didn't do. In anger, unkind words are said that make teardrops start. Why can't I free your doubtful mind and melt your cold, cold heart? But for now, for now, we need content marketing. Why? Well, we need it because our customers need it. All of the content we create should fulfill emotional needs and wants of our product. We can meet the basic needs of helping customers understand clearly what our brand does, why it does what it does, why it sells what it sells, and how it sells what it sells. But if we're going to differentiate, we must fulfill additional needs. We have to add additional value. We have to help our customers be the better that they can be. That's content marketing. And just like our customers, our audiences may well be wrong about what they need too. We will most likely never produce one piece of content after which consuming a person actually achieves self-actualization. That's not why we need content marketing. Our customers have the responsibility to give their own needs any kind of deeper meaning. Now, the reason we need content marketing is so that we can be the ones to help them as they try and find that deeper meaning. It's your story, folks. Tell it well. We'll see you next week on The Weekly Wrap. Music